This is John Cola with GrowingYourGreens.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you, and I'm here in the desert, one of the hardest places to grow. It gets over 100 degrees pretty much every day in the summertime. Today in the shade is 100, and even out of the shade today, I'm like sweating bullets, so don't mind my sweat. And where we're at, we're here in Phoenix, Arizona. And as you guys can see, I can't believe in 2016, people still have lawns. Lawns are a waste of space, especially in the desert, especially when you have to use so much water to keep your lawn green, right? And people think ponds pay waste water. There's a study by the University of Arizona that shows a pond actually saves more water than having a lawn, plus it actually attracts and provides a home for beneficial birds and insects and other creatures that can help you guys grow more food. I mean, here's another, here's another front yard of the house. We're in a standard 70s neighborhood here. And I mean, this is way better, so yeah, rocks way better than lawns and yeah if you guys still have a lawn and you're you know giving water to your lawn put in rocks that's a move in the better direction because guess what with rocks you don't got no labor right you don't got to do nothing maybe you got to pull some weeds don't spray that nasty roundup stuff that stuff will actually screw up your property and create health hazard for the creatures but better than rocks what's better than rocks rolls no rock and roll no <laughs> better than rocks Better than grass is what we see right here. My friend Jake Mace, he's done something totally different here in Phoenix. He's growing fruit trees. So fruit trees are the easiest thing in the entire world to grow, just a little bit harder than having some rocks. And the benefit of the fruit trees is guess what? They make things for you guys to eat. We need to eat every day, right? Why have to go to the store? It's so inconvenient. You got to drive 15 minutes to the store. You got to pay your hard earned money for stuff. When you could invest money in your property that you own or are renting or whatever to grow your own food. And so, what I'm going to show you guys today at Jake's place, because I have videos that I've done here before, check links down in the description below where I give you guys a full tour. We're going to give you guys a full tour today. But more importantly, we're going to focus on the fruit trees and the trees that grow the easiest in the hot desert climates, no matter what kind of desert you live in, whether it's here in Phoenix, Las Vegas, you know, uh, Arizona or uh, New Mexico, South Texas, or even deserts around the world. We want to focus on the easiest to grow trees. Especially if you guys are lazy, right? Because I want you guys to get rid of that lawn. And even if you have rocks, dig some of the rocks back or actually take the rocks out and do what Jake's doing here to create fertility and make your property even better than when you bought it, right? For the creatures, for not just the birds, the bees, the dragonflies and the insects of the area, the reptiles that live here, but also the soil microbes and the microbiome, all the creatures that are living in the soil as we speak, doing work right now. So yeah, this is the entrance to Jake's place with a little uh, arbor, it's kind of looking like the one I built at my place <laughs> and he's got it uh, decorated real nice he's got uh, edible and natives here planted in the front but I want to take you guys inside and show you guys not every tree because I mean I could be here every week this is this this is this go to Jake's channel if you guys want to see like the full tour because he does amazing jobs at that I want to just focus on the easiest trees to grow in the desert right so that's what I'm gonna get into and the ones that are the most valuable to you guys right so, I mean, with that, we got to stop right here. If you're Indian, you guys will call this the drumstick tree because these guys look like big drumsticks. If I had uh, some drums, I could probably play them with these sticks. <laughs> if these ones were really small, they'd be edible raw. You could open these guys up and just start eating the seeds out of it. The seeds also can purify water and do so much. But as much as these pods are eaten, and stuff you know that to me is like secondary what's more important on this tree are the greens as you guys know or may not know my channel is called growing your greens because besides eating fruits which I eat plenty of the greens are even more important than fruits in my opinion and this is a unique tree that actually has all the greens you can just come and eat just like spinach just like kale out of the grocery store so imagine if you had all the trees in your property you could eat the greens this one you can, it's known as Moringa. And some people say it's even more nutritious than kale. And you guys know how nutritious kale is. And this one is even easier to take care of than kale because kale might get aphids and 
have hard challenges in times of the heat in uh, Arizona. But this guy, like, there's no bugs affecting it. Oh, check it out, man. Here's some of the flowers, the Moringa flowers. Not only are they beautiful, but they're also edible. Mmm. They're good. They have actually a nice mild sweetness, but then you get that like potency <laughs> of the moringa leaves. Plus, when you eat flowers, uh, you get the pollen, and the pollen instead of letting the bees collect the pollen, and we eat bee pollen. We're not really eating bee pollen. We're eating flower pollen that the bees collected. So eat your pollen directly by eating edible flowers. I have a few videos on my channel actually on edible flowers. But anyways, the flowers are edible, and then. Uh, Inside these pods, each of these pods has numerous amounts of seeds. Let's see if we can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, probably like 10 or 12 seeds in this very pod right here that can be used to grow more trees and to spread these to other people. So I want to encourage you guys, besides just growing the fruits and the vegetables, is to save, collect, and spread your seeds out to other people and to, you know, other places so that you could grow more edible trees around. You know, I want more people eating this moringa. It's so delicious. Last time, actually, in the video link down below, I actually had moringa shots, like wheatgrass shots. But you guys can see, look at this. This tree is loaded with pods. You could also open these guys up and uh, strip out the inside. You could also eat the insides of the moringa pods as well. But yeah, there's so many. This thing is like loaded up. And the cool thing, everybody has always asked, John, where do I get the seeds for that cool moringa tree that you, got, that you showed? Well, check it out, man. These trees, Jake has been growing for three years. All these seeds that he's growing, like he won't let me harvest any of these, otherwise he might, he might uh, <laughs> drumstick whip me <laughs> with the moringa. <laughs> um, but um, he's saving these to uh, spread out to other people, people in the local area, and you guys over the internet. So if you guys want to get some of these seeds, visit his, visit his website, jakemace.com. He sells like 25 seeds for a very affordable price. Uh, if you guys live in Phoenix, they'll grow outside year-round. If you guys live in other desert climates, as long as you guys don't get below freezing or, you know, near freezing, they should do fine. If you guys live in a place that does freeze, you will need to protect them, at least minimally cut them back, mulch them heavy, or uh, grow them in a pot, take them outside in the summer, and uh, pull them inside in the wintertime. Or just, uh, you know, keep growing them as an annual uh, every summer season. The other thing I want to show you guys actually on Jake's property, he doesn't have rocks or dirt or grass on his ground. What he has is this stuff. As you guys can see, there's just uh, tons of wood chips all around. And the benefit of the wood chips is that they retain moisture. So these wood chips retain the water so well that Jake has not even watered his Moringa uh, for several years since they were established. Once they're established, he does not water these guys. So these are water saving landscape trees. That you guys should be growing. We're gonna actually have to go over to his star fruit that he does water <laughs> to show you guys the benefits of the wood chips here. So the wood chips, you know, not only retain the moisture, but also over time the wood chips break down. And uh, check it out right down here as I peel this back here. The wood chips are breaking down, and look at this black, rich stuff right here this is known as a fungal dominated compost because the wood chips are breaking down slowly over time and they are adding fertility back into the soil this is some rich black stuff right here and uh, this is what's really important in a desert environment is to not only retain the moisture but also create fertility because the soil here does not have the organic matter as most soils even on commercial farms even organic farms they're losing the organic matter, so we want to bring that back. Super critical. Now, the one recommendation I would make to Jay Jake, as good as the wood chips are, as much as these break down and add fertility, you know, you could get one better by actually, you know, uh, planting like uh, cover crops that are actually covering the land because not only like a nitrogen fixing cover crops, not only will they uh, add nitrogen and create fertility, but also they're going to provide more root zones, more root area. For bacteria and fungi to colonize on because right now as much as he's providing a good space he could do better by adding some uh, nitrogen fixing uh, crops I could see in the background he has some uh, <laughs> some weeds here growing and that's good because those are live active roots that are encouraging more microbiome but aside from 
the trees coming up, he has lots of wood chips, which is good, but hey, I want to have a few more, you know, uh, roots planted in the ground to encourage more of those microbes to give them a space to live besides just uh, encouraging them and feeding them with the wood chips. All right, let's go ahead and uh, walk around a little bit more and show you guys some other really easy to grow fruit trees for the desert. So another crop you guys definitely want to grow in the desert is this guy right here. This is a fig. And I think this is a brown turkey fig. And let me see if I can find a ripe one here for you guys. Here's one that's like so ripe it's got eaten by the birds. And I'm really particular about my figs. Like I will not harvest no fig until it's time. And how do you know the fig is, it's time for the fig? Let me see if I can find one to show you. All right, so here, here's a good, a pretty good indicator over on this side here. You guys can see this fig. And number one, it's a bit soft. This maybe means a little bit dried out, maybe not so good. But, but over on this side, this one's not quite where it needs to be, but maybe it's to right this one here today. But what happens is at, when the figs are ripe, as you guys can see, like on this green fig, it actually sticks out straight, right? Like, an, like a backwards arrow, like this is the arrow and it's connected to the tree. And then uh, this one over here, if you take a look at where it's connected to the branch, instead of coming out straight anymore, it's actually, the, it's, it's bent down. So that's one good indicator, like the fig should be bent down, even if it's soft, but it's not bent down, it's not ready to, to uh, pick it. The other thing that it's kind of soft. Now this should probably be a bit softer, and often may like to like look down at the little base here and see like some, uh, some sap coming out. That's not happening, but it's soft, and I'm hungry, so we're gonna go ahead and pick it and see. Another indicator when you pick it, if it's really ripe, it's not gonna ooze too much sap. Now this sap is actually, is the reason why your tongue burns, when you eat figs, I think it's called a fison, and it's, a, it's an enzyme that breaks down proteins. And the enzymes are in here to, to basically break down the proteins of worms and bugs that try to eat the figs. And if you guys got warts, you could take this little white sap that's coming out and put it on your wart, man. Put it on there every day. It's going to freaking eat your wart up. <laughs> it says protein. <laughs> protein dissolving enzymes. And don't do this. Don't like take that and I'm put my tongue bad idea all right so let's go ahead and rip this guy open look at this side inside this little fig right here nice juicy flesh well I mean I knew this one could have been a little bit riper but I'm hungry and I'm gonna eat all that Jake's fruit today hmm <laughs> amazingly sweet actually for not being as ripe. I mean this for me I mean I'm a fruit like connoisseur like fruit snob extraordinaire though I met one guy who's more of a fruit snob than I am but he has like 10 acres and he grows like all his own stuff. But this fig is actually quite good, at least 10 times better than the figs you guys buy at the store. Figs in the store are heresy. <laughs> They're like so picked unripe just so that they can ship them because if you picked them ripe, they'd expire so fast. But yeah, figs, one of the best crops you guys grow in the desert by far. Super easy, I mean, think about it. Where did figs come from? Figs came from a desert uh, climate. So we would just want to model that in the, de in the modern deserts, wherever they may, may be of today. And don't worry, if you don't live in the desert and you love figs, there are kinds of figs that you could even grow in the cold weather, right? Desert King Fig. You could grow those in Oregon. Even though it's called Desert King, it's one of the best varieties that grow in Oregon. And I talked to many uh, rare fruit growers up in Oregon, right? And if you guys live in Chicago, there's varieties of figs, and I'm not aware of them, that'll even do good in Chicago and around the country but make sure you get the proper variety for you. Variety is everything, and variety is also the spice of life. So the next tree that you guys have to grow, even more than the fig, and I like these actually more than figs, believe it or not, it's relatively an unknown fruit in the US. It's actually known as the jujube. And the jujube makes these little fruits that look like apples, and you could harvest these little guys that look like apples, like right now, and eat them in their fresh state, and they're, they kind of taste similar to an apple, but I would say, you know, why eat these guys in their fresh state when you have fresh figs, because the fresh figs are way better, and we want to use every fruit tree to our advantage, and when you have tons of fruits in the summertime, you don't need to eat your fruits in the summer, you're trying to preserve those, whether they're in the fridge, whether you're dehydrating them, whether you're freeze drying them, whether you're turning them to juice, whatever, you want to have fruits for the winter time when you don't have anything. And that's why I really love the jujubes because come over here and I want to show you guys what's going on in this tree. Check out this rack right here. Look, look, this jujube tree is packed full. Number one, the jujube, you know, is so fertile and creates lots of fruits, as you guys could see. 
The other thing is that it's, uh, you know, uh, it's drought tolerant. So this tree does not need a lot of water. It's also been naturalized much like the fig to grow in places where it's quite dry. Now in the beginning you might have to establish it and give it some water. Don't just like plant the tree and forget about it. But once it's established, pretty drought tolerant. The other thing that I really like about the jujube, which is a pro for me, but a con for many is that it will reproduce like mad. It'll send out runners, it'll come up in all these places that you may not want and grow more trees. But hey, more fruit trees is a good thing. Other thing people may not like is that it does have some little uh, sticker things, uh, thorns that may get you occasionally. But that's not a big deal unless you're uh, trying to get stuck with them. But the uh, reason why I like them is because uh, as you guys can see, we got the fresh fruit on here, and then we got ones that are like, this one's half dried, and then we got ones that are full dried and kind of getting wrinkly on one side. This other side's still not quite dry yet. Uh, this guy right here, if you guys could see it, still like, uh, you know, uh, dehydrating on that side and still like lighter on that side. Not quite ready, but the thing you want to do is look down at the ground. So if we look down at the ground, I like when trees self-prune and some of the damaged fruit has been dropped, you know, that it got bird pecked and whatnot. But you're bound to find one, something like this. And this one looks more like an optimally dried fruit. Now when they're in this stage, what Jake likes to do is actually pick them and take them out of the full sun, 100 degree sun, or in the shade of the leaves of the tree. And he takes them inside and he just dries them on his counter where it's a lot more cooler. So they dehydrate at a slower rate. You know, I think that in the desert, uh, the jujube may dry out too quickly and that's not a good thing either. You wanna get these at the right you know moisture percentage on the inside because when you do that and you dry them properly they're gonna taste amazing like to me these taste like angel food cake like that spongy consistency but it's in a fruit these also if you look up in Chinese medicine have crazy healing properties right I don't even know all the different properties they're anti this anti that right anti-inflammatory longevity you could make tea out of these guys but I just like to eat them because they're so good and these store, these will easily store for six months. You can probably store for even longer, a year. These have probably been found in mummies' tombs in China for all I know, right? And this is the moisture level. I like it to eat them, but even if you dehydrate them more and get them more dry, they'll last for even longer, right? So we're gonna go ahead and bite into this, show you guys what it looks like. Mmm. This one could be a little bit less dehydrated, but look at that, it's like, it, this like totally compresses and it like sponges out. So this is like totally spongy, look at that. And there's so many, there's like different varieties of jujube. Try to grow them all. Some are better fresh, some are better dried. I like the jujubes because once again, you know, they store really well, really easy to treat, to grow, and uh, more people should be growing jujube fruit, in my opinion. Let's go ahead and continue on the tour and show you guys other fruits that Jake's growing that's super easy. All right, so let's go ahead and continue on our tour. Like honorable mention for growing in like Phoenix or Las Vegas, uh, apricots. I like apricots in like, uh, you know, uh, Phoenix, Las Vegas, desert climates with similar climates, not super extreme and maybe gets a little bit cold. They do need some chill hours. I like apricots because basically they fruit and come on and the fruits are done before it gets really hot. So yeah, if you guys live in one of these climates, throw some apricots. Now, if you guys live in Phoenix, not that I'd recommend this for all desert climates because if it gets really cold, this guy's not going to do well. But another honorable mention are these guys. This is actually, I think, like one or two uh, passion fruit vines that Jake planted. And I'm, I don't think you guys can see this like underneath the canopy. But look at this. There's like all these fruits just after a few years, like hanging. There's like two there, here. There's like three here, there's like three more here, two there. But like, uh, you know, I don't want you guys to, I don't want you guys to harvest the fruit off the, off the plant, right? You always want to get the ripest fruit for the best quality, the best taste, and the most nutrition. Because the fruit will drop, in many cases, will drop the fruit when it's ready, when the tree has fully developed the seeds and the fruit pulp, uh, because the fruit's only making the fruit tree or plant or vine in this case is only making the fruit so that it can reproduce and it's only going to drop them in most cases when they're fully ripe. So we're going to look down on the ground and if we look down on the ground here we can see a bunch of different uh, passion fruits on the ground. We're going to go ahead and pick this one. It's uh, colored up really nice and passion fruits are amazing 
and we're just gonna go ahead and take my nail and see if we could open this up barehanded. Oh man, these guys are quite strong in the desert. Oh! <laughs> Had a passion fruit explosion in my hands. So we got a little hole. Let's go ahead and open this guy up for you guys. And look at that nice, rich passion fruit pulp in there. I'm gonna suck that out. Mmm. Definitely sweet tart. Mmm. I love the juice on a hot day. This would be good to make like a passion fruit lemonade. Juice and passion fruit with the seeds with some sugar cane stock, combine it together. That's me out of this world. All right, let's head around and show you guys some vegetables and just show you guys some of the fruit trees that are easy to grow in the desert in Jake's backyard. So now I want to show you guys some more fruiting crops that grow in the desert. Now this is the side of Jake's yard and he's got a couple raised beds. We're not really going to go over that because uh, he's uh, in the middle of replanting this bed here. But uh, over here he's got grapevines that basically, basically doesn't water. Having some challenges, you know, in the heat of the summer. But he's got some fruit on here that's very special. It's a variety of grape that I've never tried before. And if we go back over here and we reveal it, look at this. I think this might be the only bunch on this whole uh, place. These are actually known as blueberry grapes. Yes, that's a variety of blueberry grapes. These aren't conquerors, they're called blueberry grapes. We're going to go ahead and pick off one or two. And that's what they look like. I really want to encourage you guys to grow a deeply pigmented grapes instead of the green grapes, you know, grow the purple or the red grapes, definitely better. And try to grow seeded varieties, right? People don't understand that in the seeded varieties, there's more nutrition. The seeds contain the substance known as pycnogenol, which is very uh, antioxidant, antioxidant. <laughs> Gives you antioxidants, so basically it keeps you young and it disease proofs you. And people don't eat these foods, so. Mm. These are actually quite good. They got some small seeds, not super seedy, quite good. But yeah, grapes, another great fruit. <laughs> grapes are another grape fruit, <laughs> great fruit that uh, grows in the desert. Let's go ahead and uh, head back over here. Now we're not really gonna talk about vegetables too much today. He's got some uh, fennel and some artichokes going to flower. But some other fruits that are hanging on because it's uh, you know gotten so hot are his tomatoes, black cherries, definitely a good variety that I found grows in the desert and Jake's plants are loaded. Of course, the number one vegetable fruit that's grown in the desert, eggplants. He has some beautiful uh, striped eggplants there. And uh, let's head back through, through here. Oh, guavas, good one for Phoenix here. That's honorable mention, not, not really in the video. Of course, right here, as we walk through his gate, he's got this line with uh, more passion uh, fruits that's doing really good. This is one plant, and if we go in here, he has it all trellised up on the back, and it's just dropping all these fruits on the ground. Let's go ahead and uh, show you guys some more uh, oh fruit trees, including this fig right here. I'm going to go munch on more Jake's fruit. All right, so another variety of fig we got is uh, maybe Texas Blue Giant, I think. <laughs> and uh, we're going to, oh, and, and find a ripe one here. So let's see, we got, this one's ripe, <laughs> this one's, there's so many choices here at Jake's house. And the amazing thing is, this thing is only like a couple years old, but still it's got some ripe fruit. Look at that, nice and cracked and ready to eat. I'm gonna go ahead and break that open for you guys. I love figs, right? Ripe figs, one of the best fruits to grow in the desert. Mm. Wow, that's really a good one. This is like really ripe, really sweet, really delicious. Oh. And check it out. Good thing I didn't eat that guy. We're gonna like let him go. All right, spider, go back and eat some more bugs. <laughs> yeah. Other thing, very important when eating figs, especially the ones you grew, is uh, don't just like shove them in your mouth, like break them open and see what's on the inside first <laughs> to make sure you're not eating any spiders or uh, larvae, even worse, or other bugs. Yeah, figs gotta be one of my favorite crops for the desert. And grow different varieties. I think I got one more variety to show you over on the other side of Jake's yard. And I gotta get out of the sun before I'm eating sweat instead of fig. <laughs> so now in Jake's backyard, we wanna show you guys some more uh, trees that produce fruit. 
maybe not known as fruit trees and I want you guys really to grow some of these guys because some of these guys are native and are gonna do well in the area and are drought tolerant. Very important if you wanna conserve water because I know many people have different goals. One of my goals with growing my own food is to grow the highest quality and most varieties of food that I can because this is what nourishes me so that I could be the healthiest person, have the most energy, be able to go on long three day hikes without collapsing and vomiting <laughs> and stuff and have a mental focus in my older years or younger years because I'm getting younger every day and uh, have the energy to do what I want to do, right? And yeah, so all the varieties of foods allows you to do that and this one is a native. It's known as the ironwood. It actually has these like little uh, thorns on there and uh, you know, Jake's growing this for its edible flowers. So it's like out of flowering season right now. These could be just bought at like are normally used for landscaping and be and, and may be known as endangered actually. So you're encouraged to plant them. But not only does it encourage uh, native insects and pollinators and uh, bees and butterflies and birds, but it also produces the edible flowers and before the seeds fully mature, when they're pretty young, you could actually open them up and eat them like you would uh, raw uh, edaname beans or the soybeans. So yeah, so Jake really tries to focus on some of the natives uh, of the area as well for their edible properties. Let's go around and actually show you guys a few more uh, edible natives that are gonna do well here in the desert. So the next native style tree that I wanna share with you guys that's water saving is right here. You guys could see this thing is huge. This started off as a $7 tree for Jake, and it's a, a Palo Verde tree, more specifically a native Florida blue Palo Verde. And he was told by a botanical expert that this has the best tasting uh, fruits and flowers. So uh, this guy, once again, before it makes the mature seeds that are up on the tree somewhere, maybe actually uh, falling down on the ground here, it makes the flowers that are edible and also the immature uh, little bean pods on the inside that you guys could eat. So yeah, I really want to encourage you guys to eat your legumes, really rich in protein, and besides just having protein, they also have phytonutrients and phytochemicals and are anti-disease and actually will help melt fat off you because they help to uh, increase your microbiota or your own internal probiotics, much like we want to increase the probiotics in the soil. When you eat things like beans with all kinds of non-digestible fibers, they increase your probiotics, which make you more efficient in digesting your food, but also increase your immune system. So yeah, this is water saving. Oh, one of my favorite uh, cactuses. He has many different kinds. Actually, I kind of like how this one looks. This one like looks really cool. <laughs> it's all like little bumpy things. Hey, you could probably like back up against this and like rub up and down for back massage. Hey, it's like one of those back massager roller things. <laughs> or, but uh, actually one of my favorite kinds is actually over here. I haven't seen these too often and I'm getting stuck by all these agaves and cactus thorns and everything around Jake's place and I gotta like get a workout by squeezing through stuff. <laughs> but this is uh, a Peruvium calam calamar uh, apple cactus. And uh, these guys, I wonder if they're really ripe yet. Oh, oh, that one's so ripe it's getting eaten by the birds. Ow, got me. All right, so anyways, this is what they look like on the outside. And this is what it looks like after the birds eat it on the inside. Nothing. <laughs> There's a few small seeds on the inside. So this is going to go to uh, maybe uh, feed the uh, turtle that lives underneath this habitat <laughs> somewhere. All right, this one's kind of small. I don't know if it'll be so good. It's kind of like not mature. I mean, we're going to have to pluck one off Jake's tree. Don't, uh, don't tell him I'm picking like one of his, one of his two only <laughs> proven apple cactuses this year. I'm sure he won't mind. All right, a little bit green, uh, a little bit green. I mean, if I don't pick them, the birds are going to get them, and I'm sure Jake would want me to eat it before the birds did. All right, pluck this guy off. And uh, we're going to go ahead and show you guys what that looks like on the inside. Now, unlike standard cactus fruits that you may be able to buy a local Mexican market and eat or grow yourself in the desert, I do encourage you guys, cactus fruits, one of the most underutilized fruits in the entire world. Cactus fruits are so nutritious. And here at the store in Phoenix, they sell like 12 ounces of prickly pear juice pasteurized for like 22 bucks. So that's how much I want you guys to value cactus fruit juice and cactus fruits of all kinds.
They've done research on it and they're one of the most anti-inflammatory fruits of the whole world, prickly pear uh, cactus fruits in particular. And this is a Peruvian apple cactus. So unlike a standard prickly pears that I'm used to, this kind of more looks like a dragon fruit on the inside with the smaller seeds that are softer and more edible. But uh, unlike the dragon fruits that are white, uh, you know, these guys are way sweeter. So we're just gonna go ahead and uh, eat half of that. We're gonna save the other half for the girlfriend. <laughs> Mmm, warm by the summer sun. It's got a little bit of that, like gelatinous, aloe vera, cactus fruitness in there. Nice, sweet texture, delicious. I mean, not only are these cactuses beautiful, not only do they save you guys from watering them, they also make some amazing fruit if the birds don't get them. So grow some cactuses today. So now I want to share with you guys the Brazilian red pepper, Brazilian red pepper, Brazilian red pepper, Brazilian red pepper, right? Say that five times fast. It's not really a tongue twister. I just thought it would be funny. All right, so anyways, um, what we're looking at is a tree that's uh, mostly grown for shade and many actually landscapers use this tree. And if you guys see this tree around in the desert, wherever, whatever desert that may be, um, this produces an edible fruit. And let me tell you, these guys are amazing and you guys should just grow one of these so that you guys could grow your own pepper-like spice. So you guys know like you grind up black pepper and I wanna encourage you guys to eat your black pepper, right? Now you might have to buy your black pepper if you're not in the tropics and you have to like, you know, order that and stuff. But these make these like pink peppercorns that taste similar to that black pepper so you could boost your antioxidants, right? I want you guys to be all about your spices. Herbs grow really well here. Some herbs grow also really well besides the fruit trees. So that's the second thing you guys should grow for an easy garden besides the fruit trees that I'm showing you guys today, grow some herbs, but this is an herb and herbs are high in antioxidants and ORAC values. So what this is, it's normally used for landscaping. It's a drought tolerant, uses low water, also produces edible fruit that many people don't know. So let's go up and show you guys the fruit here over on this side. This is a Brazilian uh, red pepper. Look at this, I'll pull down this branch and if you guys look closely, look at that. There's like all these little clumps of pink peppercorn things and we're gonna go ahead and pull one of those off for you guys look at that and basically what you do is you just pull off some of these little peppercorn things and these will you know preserve and dry you can put these in like little spice grinders ikea has a good one that's ceramic blades for like 5.99 take one of these little balls put it in your mouth crunch it up it actually tastes like the pepper that you know and love but these ones that jake are growing in the rock dust and the worm castings are actually kind of sweet so it's actually quite delicious. So I could see myself sprinkling these on top of a salad, grinding them up, putting in dressings, putting them in soups. I mean, if I was here, I'd be collecting all these guys hmm, and using them on a daily basis, not only for an influx of phytochemicals, phytonutrients, and antioxidants, but also to eat more food out of my backyard instead of the grocery store, instead of buying that black pepper. Yeah, so grow one of these guys. All right, let's go ahead and show you guys a few more trees actually over here. They're kind of duplicates of before. This is another jujube tree here. As you guys can see, this guy has a smaller fruit and these guys are even drying, you know, at uh, different rates. Some of these guys are really dry. Some of them are still kind of moist. And yeah, you know, Jake is growing different varieties of different fruit trees to see which ones grow the best and which ones he likes the best. Over on this side, it's another uh, fig. And a fig is something that you can easily propagate or get your own tree from. All you gotta do is go out with a black hoodie at night with your sharpest pruners, make sure they're sharp, don't get no dull ones, and go up to a fig tree in your neighborhood that you really like, and like look around, take out your snippers and snip off the branch. It's best to do this time, do this in the winter time, not in the, in the middle of summer, right? When the tree's dormant. You're gonna take that branch off, snip it off, and then you're gonna come home to your house, put it in the ground, stick it in the ground, and it's gonna grow like this tree behind me that Jake did. The tree that Jake built, I mean, Jake grew. <laughs> And this is a fig tree from a local cutting. And as you guys can see, this is probably one of his most prolific tree trees or his most prolific figs. Lots of figs on there getting eaten by some of the birds. Let's see if I could find one that's not uh, been eaten too much. That's nice and ripe. There's so many choices here. Jake eats about 10 of these uh, during a day in the season. And I can see why they're nice and vibrant colored. Let's go ahead and break that guy open for you guys so you guys see what it looks like. Oh, look at that. This is nice and juicy. 
even more juicy than the other ones. We're gonna go ahead and eat it underneath the shade of the tree. Hmm. You know what? This has to be my favorite fig in his whole yard. Maybe a little bit small. I really like it because of its vibrant color. But also it's like really juicy and wet. I mean the other thing too is that this tree is more mature than some of the other trees growing. So you know once a tree gets more mature, it's been growing for a couple years, it's gonna start producing better and better fruit every year, provided you're feeding it like Jake does with the wood chips, the rock dust, the fungal dominated compost that he's making in place and worm castings. Mm. Once again, man, if you guys live in the desert, grow some figs. You will not regret it. And then when they're ripe, send me a message. I'll come over to your house to eat them with you. So another fruit tree that you guys will want to plant in the desert is this guy right here. It doesn't look like much now. In the you know middle of the summer, it like defoliates and looks like heck. Doesn't look so good. But in the uh, spring and fall, it's resurrected. Kind of like Jesus was re resurrected in Easter. Wait, no, I mean Christmas. Wait, when was he resurrected? I don't know. But anyways, this plant will resurrect itself in the spring and fall. I do know that. And make you tons of little fruits known as the goji berries. Uh, wolf berries are native to this area, which are similar to the goji berries. So plant either one. And if you want to get some seeds, go to your local health food store, buy some goji berries, and uh, be careful while you're eating the fruit and just pull out the seeds and sprout them up and uh, plant them in your garden after a couple years. They're gonna grow to be this big and give you guys tons of fruit. Like I grow the goji berries in my garden and literally I don't have to do anything to it and it just keeps growing even if I neglect it. And actually I encourage you guys to neglect your wolf berries or goji berries. Don't overwater them. They don't like it because they're like a desert native. All right, let's go ahead and head back and uh, show you guys a few more fruit trees before I sweat out all my water <laughs> and dehydrate here in the desert. So another fruit tree that I want you guys to grow in the desert, that's one of my favorites, is right here. Uh, this is known as the pomegranate. And as you guys can see, Jake's got some nice pomegranates are growing right here. Pomegranates are an ancient fruit, so don't just grow, you know, modern hybridized fruits. Grow some more ancient fruits. And there's a lot of varieties of pomegranates. If you guys want to go to a place that has a lots of varieties of pomegranates, actually 200 varieties, you want to check out Exotica Fruit Nursery. Put a link down below to a video I did at Exotica. But they have over 200 varieties of pomegranates. They got yellow ones, they got ones that are white on the inside, they got ones that are sweet. Pomegranates aren't, are all tart like that palm wonderful juice stuff you guys drink. There's so many different kinds. So if you guys live in the desert, I encourage you guys to grow a, a lot of different kinds and the kinds that meet your needs. Like I really love the sweet pomegranates. They're not tart, you know, and they tend to be not quite as deeply pigmented. I personally like really deeply pigmented fruits. And the pomegranates will store for a good while in the fridge, even unused. So like I actually have some pomegranates from last year's harvest, 2015's harvest. They saved into 2016 for me. I haven't checked them recently, but about a month ago, I checked them or maybe two months ago and they're still good. Like not everyone, but like 80% of them were still good. I juiced them on up and the juice tasted amazing, you know, for a springtime pomegranate juice drink. Another way people preserve the pomegranates is you could dehydrate them. So you could dehydrate the aerials and the fruit pulp around the aerial. Um, I want to freeze dry them actually one of these days. I like really want to get a freeze dry because freeze drying the aerials is probably the best way to preserve them. And when you freeze dry and take the, the liquid out of the seeds, they actually become chewy, or not chewy, but they just almost dissolve in your mouth. Like I've eaten ramutan seeds that have had like freeze dried ramutan. The seed is free, freeze dried with the fruit and it just, just crunches up and dissolves in your mouth. It's amazing. But yeah, oh, people also juice these guys, uh, juice them and then just freeze the juice like you would an apple juice. But yeah, really rich in phytochemicals and phytonutrients. And once again, it's a drought tolerant uh, crop or fruit tree to grow in the desert. Let's go ahead and continue on. Show you guys another area of uh, Jake's garden where he's growing some uh, drought tolerant, desert approved fruit trees. So another amazing desert fruit tree I want you guys to grow grows really well. The mulberries. I have friends with mulberries here in Arizona, in Nevada. I grow them myself in California and they grow many other places too besides just the desert. These are one of the most tolerant trees. I like the Persian mulberries that are nice and black and long. Jake's got white ones and purple ones and all different kinds of ones and mostly right now he's got ones in his freezer that he harvested and then preserved in the freezer by freezing them so he can make uh, mulberry smoothies. Mulberries are really deep, rich, and pigmented. The big challenge you're going to have with mulberries is not it growing and growing free of bugs and pests and diseases. But the problem you're going to have is with the birds. 
because the birds, they also love the mulberries and other creatures. So yeah, you wanna get them at their peak ripeness. Don't harvest them too early. Get them when they're full peak, dark, rich colors. Check out my Instagram for some pictures of what they should look like when they're ready and ripe. All right, so besides the mulberry, another thing you guys gotta plant in the desert, depending on where you are in the world. I mean, these guys, these are date palms. Jake has a, you know, a new one planted right here. It's been in the ground for a year or two. And then over here, he just planted some pups that he's uh, hardening off. So he's got to basically put this burlap around it so that the tip uh, growth point doesn't get burned. And he's actually also watering this every day. And so the date palms produce dates. Each date palm can produce like 100 pounds of dates a year. And the reason why I like the date palms is because they produce an edible fruit. But more importantly, these are like, besides the jujubes, one of the best fruits for storage and they have a high value. So if you're growing dates in a place where you could grow dates in the desert, you could store those for a full year in the fridge, even longer, right? There's dates been found in like the pharaohs and tombs of Egypt and the seeds are still viable. I don't know so much about the fruits, but the seeds, the date seed is probably one of the longest kept seeds that will still germinate after thousands of years. And actually I think I have a date seeds uh, germinating actually in my compost bin that I pull out and put in dirt so I have a few little baby uh, seedlings that I grew from seed but the dates uh, will save for a year plus they're very expensive if you go to buy dates right so they have a good trade value so you could trade your dates to somebody that say lives in Florida that can't grow dates to get their tropical fruit and you could ship them some of your delicious dates so yeah high trade value they're super delicious and one of these days I want to try to freeze dry dates like when they're fresh and ripe like barhi dates that are still like so moist and juicy and then freeze dry it and see what the heck happens. I think it's gonna be really good. Another really good use of dates is if you get the dried variety like uh, Daglet Noor varieties that are nice and dry and especially here in the desert in Phoenix where dr they'll dry out on the uh, palm tree which is actually more related to a grass than a fruit tree. You could dry them out and then you powder them up and then you powder them up into a date powder or date sugar and date sugar in my opinion is the best sugar if you're still eating white processed sugar get that out of your diet instead substitute date sugar which is basically just powdered date so it has the fiber has the sugar has all the phytochemicals and phytonutrients that would be in the date whole food not just some white extracted product that's void null and void of the phytonutrients and just has the carbs carbohydrates not that important phytonutrients they're the most important ingredient to me uh, in my life at this time all right, so yeah, Jake's also a Kung Fu martial artist, and I'm gonna kick this and punch this and maybe go over to this guy with an ugly face and bam, I'm gonna punch your mouth, boom, and oh, you're gonna steal my fruit? That's what I think of you. <laughs> All right, anyways, let's go ahead and tour down this area. <laughs> Jake's got some more cool things going here. Um, you know, this is like uh, not part of the regular desert video. This is actually part of like uh, the tropical fruit video you could grow in Phoenix, and I'm gonna cover real quick for you guys. Uh, let's see, Jake's got all these different kinds of mangoes that have been uh, growing in this uh, protected area next to a wall. This is a, a pineapple pleasure mango, and Jake's got uh, banana palm, banana herbaceous trees. <laughs> they're, not, they're not really trees, but bananas. And he's got a ice cream bean. This is one of my favorites right here. Uh, and then he's got, of course, uh, papayas he's growing. Oh, and I gotta show you guys this over here. This got, got to be one of my favorite trees to grow. And if you guys live in like a, a desert climate, like Las Vegas, like Phoenix, where it doesn't get super cold, you wanna go over, where is it? Oh, it's over here. So this is a tree I want to show you guys right here. This, this is a tree, guys, if you guys live in like uh, Phoenix, uh, desert, or like Las Vegas, or somewhere with a similar climate, like not super extreme, you guys wanna get this kind of avocado. Avocado is one of my favorite fruits in the whole world. And uh, this is known as the Aravipa avocado that was actually found here in Arizona, out in the wild, not even in a developed area. Just a random tree out in the wild. They got cuttings, they started propagating it, and now they're making it available. And it grows, you know, for the first few years, might need some protection, but once it's established, not gonna need any protection, and it's gonna make avocados for you, even in the extremes of the desert. Now, one of the things I want you guys to do is to grow foods that cost a lot of money to buy in the store, right? Like, I don't necessarily grow carrots because carrots are really inexpensive to buy. But how much, when you price the avocados, how much are they to buy in the store? Well, depending where you live, you know, some places avocados could cost a buck, two bucks each, right? 
You could have your own tree that could be loaded with avocados. You could have like 100 avocados on there. What's that worth? 100, 200 dollars? Maybe when your tree's even older, it has 300 avocados. What kind of value is that? You no. Know? Now the big question is, John, but you know, I'm a prepper, man, and I want to store my avocados, and avocados, they don't store well. Well, you know, you could pick an avocado right when it's uh, in its right mode, so when the skin kind of gets dull, you want to harvest it, even if it's still hard. You could keep it off the tree and preserved in a fridge at the right temperature, not too cold, and it could store for a couple months, pull it out, and it's still going to ripen up for you. So that way you could kind of extend your harvest. Uh, avocados, you could freeze them, but then they kind of get all funky. You could do that if you do like it and pull the air out in a Ziploc. Um, but the best way, you could dehydrate them, but they turn black. The best way to preserve your avocados, freeze dryer. You could take your avocados, take out the pit, freeze dry the flesh, and then seal it with an oxygen absorber packet, and then uh, you know suck the air out of that package. And then actually those avocados, you put water in it, you, and then it, you just rehydrate it, and it tastes just like an avocado. Amazing. And you could make your own guacamole freeze-dried dips that you could take on hikes, do anything with. Um, you know, just make the guacamole, then freeze dry it, and then pre that preserves it, right? Just like astronaut food. So yeah, freeze drying, I'm going to hopefully have videos on it one of these days. Best way to preserve your avocado for long-term use, and especially on hikes, right? Avocados are, are really rich in protein and also uh, calories. So a really rich food to take on hikes to concentrate food in a small amount of space. So I can't wait till Jake's Air Viper Avocado is producing here in Phoenix, and I'm going to get to try some. I think what we're going to do next is because I could like be here all day going over stuff and I didn't get to show you guys the vegetable garden, but I'm getting really hot. I would actually want to sit down with Jake and actually talk to him more about, you know, some of the fruit trees, some of the crops that he grows in the desert. That's super easy, super simple and share with you guys some more of Jake's philosophies about uh, gardening life, Kung Fu and uh, fruit trees. So now I'm sitting down with Jake Mace in the shade <laughs> and I'm glad I'm in the shade. I don't know if you guys can see this on the camera, but if my shirt like this top half it's like a little bit darker in color than the bottom half because it's like, it's just sweat. Like, I don't know this, I mean, I can handle Las Vegas heat, it's not a problem, but man, that, that extra 10 degrees here in Phoenix, that'll get you, man, if you're not used to it. <laughs> so uh, There's like 20 pounds of sweat in your shirt. Yeah, like I'm, I'm, I could come out to Phoenix and like, I don't know if I'm eating enough to even gain the weight that I'm losing in water by sweating. <laughs> <laughs> shade is, and that's a good lesson for gardeners out there to plant shade trees that will shade your other stuff. Actually, yeah, that's important. So Jake, let's go over some of the tips. I mean, my viewers saw some of the fruit trees that I like the most here in the desert. It's, you know, the standard date palm, the jujube uh, fruit, uh, the fig, of course, the pomegranate. And uh, why don't we talk about some of the native and water saving, uh, you know, foods that I showed in this video, like the ironwood, the Brazilian pepper and that uh, that other what is that one? The Palo Verde. The Florida, Palo Verde. Yeah. Florida so tell blue. everybody about those things and why they're so valuable for your landscape and what you've seen when growing them. You know, in my opinion, you know, on my vegan athlete YouTube channel, I talk about my favorite fruit trees to grow in the Phoenix area, and a lot of them are the same as people in the Middle East are growing because our climates are yeah. similar, right? So guavas and figs, pomegranates, all these things you already mentioned, and dates. People underestimate the power of date palms and plant it now because they take a few years to fruit. But once a date starts fruiting, it's an enormously important food source for hundreds of years. Um, but that being said, I'm also really big into cactus that fruits and is edible and the trees that don't ever have to be watered once they're established. So like John mentioned, Palo Verde, any variety of Palo Verde, I like the Florida blue Palo Verde. Flowers and the pea pods are in the legume family and they're edible. Ironwood, same thing. Ironwood has delicious flowers and the uh, edamame pea pods are also edible. Get them before they turn into hard seeds. Get them while they're green. Mesquite. The oh, ancient... mesquite. Yeah, do you have mesquite here? I have. The, that's what the big ones are back here, right there. Big mesquite tree. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, no, no. I should have included that in the video. Mesquite, my, one of my favorites. When it, it's a race between me and my dogs. Who can collect the mesquite pea <laughs> pods first? Because those yellow mesquite pods are super rich in nutrients carbohydrates, proteins, and the ancient people that lived in Phoenix, like the Hohokam and other native peoples, would use the mesquite, grind it into flour, and that would be their tortillas and their um, and their chips of ancient days. So wow. Yeah, companies should come out with mesquite chips, man. That'd be cool. And answer me a question down in the comments below. Why doesn't every grocery store in the Phoenix area carry mesquite flour? It's so abundant here. It makes no sense. Yeah, there's like, they're totally dropping on the ground. Cars roll over them and they're like, it's so lame. Like, I know there's a, isn't an organization in the area that has a grinder that'll rent it out to people and that sure. collects it. 
There's a guy in Tucson named Brad Lancaster oh, who does Tucson, that. Tucson, yeah. yeah. He's a great guy, great information from Brad. But those kind of programs and those kind of grinders should be way more abundant yeah. because there are so many mesquite trees here. But Palo Verde ironwood mesquite, great trees. But also, I love the cactus, like the, the prickly pear called the nopales or nopalitos. All of my friends who are Mexican, who have Mexican heritage in their family, come over. When we do a vegan barbecue, they grab the prickly pear pads and put them on the barbecue and grill it up. Really? It's amazing. Right wow, there, man. Like barbecued prickly pear pads instead of hot dogs. And then they put it in a hamburger and they eat like a prickly pear hamburger instead of a regular No hamburger. way. So like what do they season it up with? Just regular seasonings. Yeah. So just like barbecue seasonings, just like you put on a hamburger, but they do that with cactus pads. And then we put some some kale and spinach and tomato from the garden, some onions, and it's a fantastic you know way to eat out of your yard. Plus, when the prickly pear cactus grows the fruit, they call it the tunas, las tunas. Yeah. So it's not, so not tuna fish. Right. No. I know. But the tunas are so delicious, and I go out in the desert every year and sustainably harvest prickly pear fruits from my yard and from the desert, the hikes I go on, and then I freeze them all season long in my freezer. Because like you say, they're super important for smoothies and as an anti-inflammatory. Yeah, I like the juice of myself. Like I just drink the juice fresh, straight, actually mixed with uh, some uh, coconut uh, milk that I make extract fresh and straight along with the uh, cactus fruit. So when you add some fat to the antioxidants, you get a greater uptake of the nutrition plus it just tastes way better you know and one thing every time i'm with john he's so hospitable he brings out <laughs> fresh squeezed cactus and coconut juice and I or just, some, some other kind of juice for jake i just love it i love it it's the reason why um i call this guy my friend because he's, <laughs> he's bribing me with fresh juice out of his garden i just love it so cool so jake let's talk about some of the different uh, things you do to keep your trees that my viewers saw today alive because i don't i know you just don't like put down Tons of manure or something like that. You you guys saw that he puts down wood chips. But other what other kind of fertility do you add on a regular basis to you know get these healthy trees that I showed you guys today? You know I would say if you're new to fruit trees or if you already have them planted, mulch. Mulch is the most important thing, and veganic mulch. If you can combine uh, a good ratio of leaves, food scraps, uh, straw like bales of straw, you can get organic straw. Uh, and wood chips. I get it all for free. I get my wood chips, my straw, my food scraps is just food scraps, and my leaves all for free. And I mix it all up together, and then I add some of the rabbit poop and chicken poop from my chickens, rabbits here on site. And I mix it all together. I throw in some azomite, I throw in some worm castings, and I throw a little bit of biodynamic locally made compost. And I mix it all together in my wheelbarrow, and that becomes the top ground cover around each tree. And if you do that, the worms, the earwigs, the roly polies, and the mycelium just find their way into the tree's roots. Cool, so do you add also worm castings and what kind do you use in uh, the rock dust, of course? What kind do you use? Yeah, I mean, John's way more of an aficionado, aficionado of rock dust, but I just use straight azomite. Um, I get it in the micronized powdered form. If you guys want to try a small bag, I have it at jakemace.com if you want to try it, but John always is great about his YouTube channel showing you where to get it around the cities you live in. Add that in. I usually add the worm castings and the azomite in seasonally. Now so, how much do you add though? You know, a tree, tree like this tree behind me is called a Barbados cherry. It's an acerola cherry tree. And it's about maybe 10 feet tall. And I would say four times a year, every time the seasons change, I just take about maybe half a dozen handfuls and put it around the trunk of the tree and then kind of massage it in a little bit and then water it in. And especially cool. now in the Phoenix area, it's monsoon season, so feed your trees with the worm castings, the azomite, compost, straw, leaves, and mulch, and wood chips now. Right. Because then mm. Mother Earth will monsoon rain it in for you, and you'll have healthy trees all summer long. Plus, when you use a lot of wood chips, like I've brought over 40 landscaping trucks full of wood chips in my yard so far. Wow. And each truck is like, you know, dozens and dozens of regular truck beds full, all for free. I just spread it myself. That's why I get the guns. You know? <laughs> and the point of this is that it, it builds the soil, healthy, nutrient-dense soil for my trees, but also it conserves an infinite amount of water. We try to do anything we can in the Phoenix area to prevent evaporation and keep the water in our fruit trees root system. Awesome, Jake. So talking about water evaporation, man, you got this nice pond behind me and water must be evaporating out of that pond as we speak. So why don't you talk to that? Cause I know a lot of people like are against ponds cause you're wasting water, but what, 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 how, why is that pond more sustainable than having a lawn and why is that pond good for you, your garden, your fruit trees and your vegetables and all that? 
Well, first of all, the fish are very relaxing. So selfishly, I don't take drugs for relaxing or anxiety. I just watch my koi fish, and all my koi fish were adopted off Craigslist from families who couldn't keep them anymore. So they're all rescue fish. Number two, uh, there was a study from U of A that you guys can look up yourselves on Google that uh, showed that a lawn compared to a pond in somebody's yard, the pond was a way better usage of water because it used less water to maintain the level of the pond. Plus, the dozens and dozens and dozens of different varieties of native birds, native dragonflies, nega, uh, uh, different native insects that use the pond as a lifeblood source were so much more abundant than a lawn because a lawn was only found to attract the pest bugs and the pest birds and there was no use of the lawn besides. And most people don't even use their lawns. Yeah. Their kids don't really plan on it. Their kids go somewhere else. So a total waste. It's all just for ego. The pond is great because I also use the water to water my trees, um, as I call what I call Jacoponics. So I, <laughs> I put a pump in there and I pump the water out with a hose to all my tropical trees once a week, and then I fill the pond back up again. So it uses no more water than a pool, uh, and everybody has a pool in Phoenix. So if you're gonna have a pool, you might as well get rid of your pool and do a pond. You can use the water for your trees, you can have fish, you can provide a lifeblood source for all the native wildlife, and truly, I have great blue herons, cranes, I have kingfishers, uh, cactus wrens, I mean so many birds I don't even know what they are. And the amount of different colored dragonflies is amazing. I mean, I'm so happy with this pond. I built it myself from scratch. I'm about to upload a video on my Vegan Athlete YouTube channel. That's been three and a half years in the making. It's gonna be an hour and a half long video of my pond from beginning to end. I just am editing it. Time lapse? Last. Uh, no, well it's just it's me. how you made it. How I made it from scratch oh, wow, over a three cool. year period. And I built the pond from scratch. It has a rubber liner in it, so all the water stays in. And I just, I think it's a great use of water. Yeah. Plus I harvest rainwater off my house. Oh, into the pond. Into the pond. That's great, yeah, yeah water collection. Cool, so Jig, talking about water, how much do you water di your different fruit trees here that we, some of the ones we talked about, and some of the ones that you just have growing that we actually didn't uh, mention in this video? You know, I was, it depends on the tree. All the natives, I don't have to water them. Um, the Moringa trees, I don't have to water those anymore. They're already big enough where they can take it on their own. But since my property is pretty young, this whole property full of over 200 fruit trees and several thousand square feet of raised bed gardens was just a clay lot five years ago. So I'm watering a little more than I have to just to push off new growth to get my trees into fruiting stage. I could probably water less than, than I do. But as my water bill increases uh, uh, $1, my food bill <laughs> decreases $3. So I save a lot more money in my food bill um, if I have the fruit here at home. And then grow things that are water conscious like grapes, dragon fruit, edible cactus, and native trees. Cool, so how much is your water bill? Because I know people are wondering about that. I, I think that's kind of like a personal question that's kind of like, how much do you make? So I don't want to say the exact thing, but you know, in the winter time, it's probably about a hundred bucks. And in the summertime, it does get to several hundred um, in the heat, of, like right now in the heat of the summer. But once monsoon season begins, I can water less, and all the water from my roof and my solar panels goes into my water catch system. And uh, again, I really believe in this. If you're growing your own food at home, it doesn't matter how much water you're using. Because those of you who are not even vegan out there are using way <laughs> more water for meat food than for plant food, first of all. But, and, but you're not using it directly, you're just buying the meat. Which they use so much water to grow meat and animal products. And so this is not John's opinion, this is my opinion, <laughs> that having a vegan diet as part of your life is infinitely good for, for conserving water. Number two, growing the food at home should be what the water's for. Yep. You know, and then if you are gonna grow food at home, use the wood chips to keep it in the soil, the water in the soil, and also grow um, drought tolerant trees like the Moringa, ironwood, palo verde, mesquite, grapes, dragon fruit, even like carob, and, and those kind of trees are really low water. Yeah, Jake, so it may be your, your opinion on that topic, but it's also actually a fact yeah. <laughs> that vegetables take way less, and fruit trees take way less more water per calorie than animal products, because we gotta grow the crops for the animals, but then we gotta feed them, and then we gotta feed the, wa the water more animals. So if you're an environmentalist, right, you should be minimizing or eliminating all the animal products in your guys' diet and grow your own, even if the water bill is more expensive, yeah. because that water has to come from somewhere, and California may be in a drought, but a lot of that water for California is going to animal agriculture. And if it was going to vegetable agriculture, they'd be able to grow far more, or if that vegetable agriculture that's being fed to cows, i.e. corn, soy, went to grow food for people, 
you know, I believe we wouldn't have a food shortage just being done very efficiently due to government subsidies that I don't actually believe in. <laughs> so you know, because we're we're growing incredible food um, as a human population, then we're giving it to animals instead of to ourselves. And so I think that growing at home is not only is growing your own food at home, like John talks about, uh, really good for the planet, but it's also good for you because the nutrients are there in the food because you're eating it ripe. Plus, it doesn't have to be shipped. Plus, I'm really big into this lately. All my I do gardening classes and gardening tours now. In addition to martial art classes, I'm like. Kind of like a Mr. Miyagi, where we do the gardening and the, and the martial arts. But do you but paint I, the fence? I paint it, <laughs> and I wax the car on and wax the car off, and I sand the floor. Uh, but what I've been teaching lately is that um, I lost my train of thought here. I've been teaching lately is that um, always when he wax off, he like loses his train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about water usage. <laughs> I went into the brain funk. Uh, oh yeah, I say that you know. That water that we are using should be for growing your own food at home. And the more food that you guys out there can produce in your own front and backyard will free you from work, okay? Those of you out there that have to work two jobs or over 40 hours a week because the economy is still not good. You're working a job that pays you too little and you gotta work way too many hours. If all your food is grown at home, you will find that you can actually work less hours because you'll be healthier, and you'll have more money to go spend on other things. And so I really would encourage you guys to grow your food at home, like John says, keep on growing because it's a way to free yourself from the slavery that is modern day capitalism. And that's getting kind of preachy, but it is Yeah, true. no, the, the tyranny of capital, I, I agree. You know, I want you yeah. guys to be producers instead of consumers. And you know, as much as you guys think, oh man, Jake's water bill, that's too expensive, I couldn't afford that. Dude, you guys are buying food. And so like, okay, so you're buying cheap food at the dollar store and it's like cheap food. That's even worse because now you're ruining your health and now your health care bill is going to cost you more money. It's like, where do you want your money to go, right? You could invest it in, in your health, yourself, and, you know, and not having to work. Or you could invest it in cheap food, you know, expensive health care later. But, John, I got insurance that pays the health bills. Well, somebody's paying. That's one of my dad's favorite saying. Oh, John, sure. there's no such thing as a free lunch. Somebody's always paying, right? The money has to come from somewhere. So I want you guys to take responsibility, right? If you, have a, if you have a heart attack, I gotta pay for it. Indirectly, you know? Everybody pays indirectly, yeah, through yeah. our insurance system that, once again, is something that I don't, that Obamacare that I don't necessarily believe in either, that we're, we gotta pay this BS crap. Yeah, Because exactly. I don't need health care, man. Health is about, if you eat healthy, you're not gonna have to go to the doctor. I rarely ever get sick, and when I do gotta go to the doctor, I pony up and pay, right? Maybe once a year, I broke my arm a couple years ago, actually, it was at my brother's house, so actually, insurance covered that, I didn't have to pay, but, you know, otherwise I, ne I never get sick. You know, most people go to the doctor for things that they need that they don't need to go to for. Like, you know, things, problems with their heart and cancer and things that may be able to be prevented and probably be able to prevent it in my opinion by eating proper and not eating junk foods. The other thing is, you know, even if you're paying your water bill, you gotta like bring in wood chips and you can't get them free like Jake does and you gotta buy rock dust that's expensive. Jake gets it for like really cheap, um, like I do or, you know, whatever and you got to build infrastructure, bring in compost to build your raised beds. This is an investment yeah. and it's an investment in your property. It's going to make your property values more for those people that appreciate it. So yes, that's going to be a little bit smaller of a market, but also it's an investment in your health and your future and your kid's future, right? And being able to have food in case shit hits the fan, yeah. right? And so invest in yourselves, in your property, in, in the food you're growing. And don't think of it as an expense, right? Oh, it's just so expensive, my water bill. Like, my water bill growing vegetables, because let me tell you guys, vegetables are a lot less thirsty and take less water than the trees. If you're gonna grow the trees, grow the trees that I showed you guys in this episode, because those are the ones that are water conserving, because they're the, they're the best ones for the desert climate, right? Not some of the extracurricular bonus trees and things that I showed you, but some of the core trees that we talked about. Or grow some vegetables, because, you know, vegetables take a lot less water than the trees, because why? Trees are huge. They got to feed their whole vascular system water so that they don't dehydrate. Vegetable plants are a lot smaller. And that's why I like growing your greens. You could grow greens inside microgreens. A couple spray, uh, sprays of water, you know, to spray your seeds down to keep them a little bit moist will grow them a lot compared to that much water is not going to do crap for a tree. So yeah, grow vegetables if you're like one of those water saving fanatics or 
like like Jake does, catch your water, have it run off the house into you know big uh, IBC totes like he does, or run it into your pond so that you you could reuse the water and use it properly. You know when it's monsoon season or when it's raining out. Yep, and then we, I even personally, my opinion about my vegetable garden is I put a little more coconut core than I should because oh, yeah. I want to keep the moisture in the soil. Another thing for the moisture, Jake, is, you know, add organic matter. So, like, yeah. if you guys are tilling up your garden every day, you know, or every season with the rotor tiller, you're losing organic matter. You're losing the microbes. The microbes actually allow you to use less water. Mycorrhiza, I think it's like 20%. You could use 20% less water if you have a good mycorrhizal colonies and activity and a whole bunch of different microbes and bacteria in your soil and also getting you know more drought tolerant crops in your garden i mean this this video was more about the uh, fruits but hey jake let's talk about vegetables since you guys you grow some amazing vegetables here in phoenix like what are some of your tips for the water saving vegetables that grow well here in the uh in the summertime well plant them in a microclimate to eliminate direct so like yours are like under a big tree mesquite tree yeah i use the mesquite tree to diffuse the light you know especially uh seasonally so i planted in a way where in the summertime the mesquite tree plays more of a role for shade than in the winter time. Um, I put a little more coconut core. When everybody tells me to put this amount of peat moss or coconut core, I use coconut core. I want to be more sustainable. I put a little more because I just think it really um, keeps the moisture in the soil better. And then I will even, once my plants get established and they're looking pretty good and they're producing tomatoes or peppers, I put a little bit of mulch on top of the soil to keep the water in the root system. Some of my tricks. And then also uh, get an irrigation system, which the last time John was here, he made fun of me for not having an irrigation system. And I couldn't let this little raw vegan little. guy make fun of me. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's pretty big. Um, I couldn't make, let you make fun of me. So I put an irrigation system the next week and it's been uh, conserving water because I can turn it on during, you know, little incremental periods during the day. And it also saves me a lot of time. And also what you were saying, you know, um, along the lines of money, you know, vote with your dollars yep. in today's world. I think that the ability that we have to vote for politicians is infinitely less important in today's world than voting with your money. So take this stuff and spend it on you and do that in the form of your garden. Because in 10 years, your garden's worth a lot of money yep. and that money goes into feeding you and everybody wins. And so. especially if food's starting to get scarce in the future, which, you know, you never know what's gonna happen with companies being in control of your life, basically. That's when we have the martial arts and the, to defend ourselves. <laughs> so you have like, shit hits the fan, Jay's got martial arts to kick your ass. My wife and he's has growing guns. his own food. Oh, and the <laughs> wife has guns, yeah, so don't mess with Jake. <laughs> I think that if we get to that point, we're going to be in, in a bad state. <laughs> so, and if aliens come, like your shirt, then we're just screwed anyways. And I think that, oh my god, if aliens come, I'm the first to go. <laughs> I'll be first in line saying, you know, and this shirt says, I want to believe. So I want to believe that you guys can grow your food at home, that's the thing. <laughs> but I think that, you know, guys like John, look at John, I mean, he's a 20 plus year plant-based raw guy that grows his food at home and he's in great shape. I mean, he's trim. John right now could run several miles if he needed to to get away from something. And that's what health's all about is eating for health, doing hobbies that are healthy so that if you had to run or be athletic and be an animal again, you could. And 90% of people that I meet, <laughs> they, they couldn't run like that anymore. They're, they're, they're too unhealthy to be a real animal. So growing food at home is step one to getting yourself into a really healthy state inside and out, I think. Yeah, I mean, besides just growing the stuff at home too, I want you guys eating it. And actually that was oh a video God. that Jake and I made last time together, you know? Yeah. As much was... as like a lot of people grow food at home, I mean, they, they'll they grow food at home in a garden thing and then they'll go out to eat at McDonald's or a fast food place or like I a gardening event will have like all this cakes and cookies, man. No, let's eat, let's bring the stuff from the garden. Yeah. Like I really want you guys to eat that. so. So Jake, what's a tip, like one, your best tip for people to eat more out of their garden, like why should they do it? Because if you put the work into growing the food in your garden, you, you'll be so stubborn, you won't let it go to waste. <laughs> Seriously, you will eat more healthy because you will force yourself to eat the food that you worked hard to grow. It sounds dumb, but kids too, you know, kids will eat the food because it comes from the garden. My little niece, um, uh, Lillian, came over the other day and she was like, I want to go to the garden. We went, where do you want to go? She goes, I want to go to the carrots. And she knew, where, she knew where, they, where they were. And she knew to go to the garden bed for carrots instead of a fast food bag for food. Cool. I thought that was so cool. So I would say, um, grow the food at home so that you actually eat it and then put it in this hole and let it become all of this. Because if you let it go to waste, then it does nobody any good. Yeah, and a lot of people might say, John, how do you use the, you know, this food or that food, right? 
one of my favorite ways to use pretty much any food if I got too much is to juice it because juicing yeah. it you're gonna compress down the nutrition and you're gonna get rid of all the fiber not that the fiber is not good we do need fiber right but we need more nutrition is more important in my opinion than just simply fiber that feeds our bacteria in our guts and actually keeps us clean as a broom right we need phytonutrients and phytochemicals so juicing it reduces it uh, you know so you could actually get that in you I could take five pounds of carrots and it reduces down to like five cups of juice and I got all the nu nutrition for me and my worms get all the fiber and then it you know indirectly feeds my next season's garden and whenever I see you you're always juicing stuff and juicing number one I would say juicing one of the most important ways to consume your veggies and then also dehydrating yeah dehydrating but yeah don't become dehydrated <laughs> so that's why I like juicing because it has the water rich water richness but juicing first uh, yeah even like make some juice and then freeze it right and then uh, if you got to of course dehydrate your food and if you're gonna re-eat your food after you dehydrate it soak it in water first no and Jake's getting one of his uh, special treats for you guys some of the stuff you guys can juice is stuff like this so <laughs> you can juice beets that you grow that's a beet that uh, Jake grew and this is one that I brought from my house what <laughs> look at that man <laughs> that thing's huge all right just kidding all right, Jake, what is this beet, man? These were some beets that I got from Baker Creek Seed Company, and um, I just had not seen them in the garden. The other day I went, I saw them in the garden, like they were hiding from me, and boom, an overripe, crazy big beet that's growing in rock dust and worm castings. So, Jake, what do you do with your beets this big? Uh, we'll probably juice it, honestly, juice them up. Yeah, juice, beet juice, really good, especially if you had some, uh, you know, problems with your uh, blood pressure and, and heart stuff. And, you know, also you cook up your beets, right? Or kung fu weapons. Yeah, I mean, I'll beat you over the head with it. Boom! <laughs> but, you know, it's just fun. Gardening's fun. It's a healthy hobby physically. Um, like John says, all his muscles come from his composter and from his garden. Yeah. And, um, I really think that it's uh, an important thing to do. So, I'm definitely got to say, I know this video is going to end pretty soon, but I've been inspired by John Kohler's videos. When I first started gardening, you know, five, six years ago, I didn't know where to go. I took a couple of classes in town from some local people that I'm not friends with. But the majority of my garden experience was living through John's YouTube videos because I watched him transform his San Francisco house from a grass lawn into a raised bed system. And I just copied his soil, I copied his arbor, I copied his raised <laughs> yeah. beds. I was even at the time, you guys um, know me on YouTube for martial arts. If you guys go search Jake Mace on YouTube, you'll find my Kung Fu and Tai Chi videos. And our Shaolin Center Kung Fu and Tai Chi channel now has 325,000 followers and 50 million views. When I first started YouTube, I didn't know what to do. I wanted to make videos. I just copied John's format. He would say, all right, it's John Kohler with growingyourgreens.com. And then I would say, hey, it's Jake Mace with jakemace.com because he's the only guy that I knew that was doing YouTube full time. So I want to thank John for putting his life on online because I've learned a lot, not just with gardening, but also with a lot of other things. So thanks for all the, all the help. Oh, you're welcome, yeah. Jake. So yeah, this video's got to come to an end. It's already too long, and I know a lot of you guys complain when it gets too long. So Jake, any last words for my viewers today about growing in the desert? I mean, in the extremes here in Phoenix that I can't handle since I'm totally sweating in Vegas, I'd be <laughs> fine, but here, I don't know. You know, I would say specifically grow date palms. Yeah. Grow yeah, female agree, fruiting yeah. date palms. I would say grow fig trees. I would say grow edible cactus like the prickly pears and anytime you find one that's got a delicious fruit, take a pad mm -hmm. off and grow it at home. I showed you some. Yeah. Grow grapes try growing dragon fruit and um and then on the side experiment with some other things like bananas if you want to experiment but those things i mentioned first are the best things to grow in the phoenix area well yeah i would say uh, jujubes oh the oh the, the jujubes are so good and moringa yeah moringa i mean can't almost, forget that i would even say almost more important than wheatgrass is to eat and juice and consume your moringa and those trees are amazing i got one behind the camera right now that's gone from seed to 10 foot tall moringa tree in six months mm. And you guys Amazing. get the seeds in 25 pack, a pack of 25 seeds for four bucks from jakemace.com. That's cool. Yeah. So yeah, oh, the other green that I re recommend, I didn't get to show you guys because this is a fruit video, was Egyptian spinach. So Egyptian mm. spinach, another really good green, actually better, better tasting than the moringa, more mild uh, to grow in the summertime because, you know, greens are the most important. But uh, anyway, Jake, if somebody wants to learn more about you, order the seeds, watch your videos on Kung Fu or gardening, how can they learn about you? And, all right. You got two YouTube channels. You got Vegan Athlete on YouTube or Shaolin Center on YouTube. But just in the YouTube search bar, search Jake Mace and you'll find me or go to jakemace.com. You can also join my uh, very popular Facebook gardening group at Urban Gardening in Arizona. Cool, cool. Yeah, and we did a, we did a clip today. You could actually see when I was here, because this is actually being 
filmed and then probably posted later on my channel. But it I was, did a live shot with Jake this morning. It was live. And also follow John and I. That was the first on, thing, yeah. John and I on Instagram. That's yeah, a great yeah. place to get yeah, us. Yeah, check my Instagram thing. Yeah, I try to post a picture every day. I love the live videos. It's kind of raw, people like it. And um, the Urban Gardening Group, you can always kind of get notified when the live video comes up. And you never know who's going to join me for a live video. <laughs> it could be John Kohler. Cool, cool. Right on, Jake. Well, I've had definitely fun here eating some of your fruit. I think Absolutely. I'm going to go ahead and eat some more before I leave. And uh, if you guys enjoyed this episode with JK, please give me a thumbs up. If I get enough thumbs up, I'll be sure to actually make a special drive down to Phoenix. Maybe not in the middle of summer, maybe like in September when it cools off a little bit to raid some of his other fruit trees that he's got going on at that time and sharing with you guys what he's doing because Jake's doing some amazing work. And I wish I had a place this big to grow even more fruit trees than Jake's growing because <laughs> my place is way smaller. But And I hope that one day Jake expands his vegetable garden and grows more greens. You know, I'm sure Jake eats lots of fruits, but you know, he looks a little bit green deficient to me. <laughs> but anyways, and I want you guys to grow your greens too. And also be sure to uh, share this video with somebody else that lives in a desert environment, whether that's Las Vegas, Phoenix, you know, New Mexico, Southern Texas, wherever, because it's gonna allow them to grow things that are easy so that they can get rid of that lawn, get rid of those rocked in landscape and start actually growing some things that's gonna benefit, benefit them and actually save water at the same time. And as a result, free them from the system. And yeah, free yourselves from the system. I mean, as much as you guys think I teach gardening, I really want to teach you guys about freedom and having yeah. more true freedom than this artificial freedom that we all believe in. Because when you're a slave to the system, whatever system that is, the food system, the government system, you know, the job system, the corporate system, you are a slave, even though we're free and we abolished slavery years ago. So anyways, yeah, we got, we, <laughs> so yeah, also be sure to check my past episodes. I have a lot of episodes, mostly having to do with how to grow your own food. <laughs> and I'm also thankful for these videos on your channel because you came here a year ago. So yeah. folks can watch our last video and they can see how my yard has changed year by year. Yeah, check it out. Link down below in the description. <laughs> also be sure to click that subscribe button right down below. Super important. I have videos every three to four days. You never know where I'm gonna show up in the world. You never know what you're gonna learn. And you're always going to learn something new because that's part of my goals every time I film a video is I want to teach you guys something that you guys could use in your life and not just a stupid three minute video. Hey, this is how you plant a date palm and then you don't get the backstory on really how or why to do it. And I think that's a big problem with our educational system and our young people of today. So I appreciate you guys that are younger that have watched through this whole video because you guys are really learning the nuts and bolts of how to really make things work instead of just this quick how to thing where you really don't get to know stuff. And now I really know why my dad talks so much. <laughs> so I love you, dad, if you're watching this. My dad doesn't watch my videos, so. Hey, I'm, I'm 34, am I considered younger? <laughs> hey, you're young kids. Yes. <laughs> but anyways, so I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Once again, my name is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com. We'll see you next time. And until then, remember, keep on growing. All right, this is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com to do another exciting episode for you. And what we're gonna do today for you guys is thanks to uh, somebody on Fiverr that wanted to do a coaching session with me, but instead of a coaching